And we continue with our, our, our series on the Ottoman Empire, which has been so uh, absolutely fascinating. From a most distinguished speaker, uh, Professor Aksan, who's been known, of course, in the field of Ottoman studies for, for many decades as one of its leading practitioners. And today she's going to look at a, a, a topic which I think remains of um, continual importance uh, today, particularly around uh, uh, the eyes of three military figures, uh, Husrev Pasha, Omar and Mahmud Shevket Pasha. So, well, Professor Aksan, we welcome you to deliver your talk, An Empire Besieged the Last Ottomans. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll get my... See if we can make that work. Everything okay? Yes? Thank you. Fine. All righty. Yep, that's Thank fine. You very... All righty. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. I, it is a privilege to be here with you today. I've had a long interest in biography and perceptions of difference based on early family travels in Denmark and Turkey. My first book was devoted to Ahmed Resmi Effendi, the 18th century diplomat Frederick the Great in Berlin, just as the Seven Years' War was drawing to a close. That I gravitated to military history was largely a result of reading Ahmed Resmi's scathing analysis of the poor performance of the Janissaries and Sepahis on the Danube frontier against Habsburg and Romanov armies. I assumed naively that the Ottoman archives would unfold the mysteries of the Janissary system and its dissolution in 1826. When I emerged from the archives a decade later, I just scratched the surface and the writing of 18th and 19th century military history with the bicentennial of 1815 and the centennial of World War I had become a thriving enterprise and the subject of global histories. Book, billed as a second edition of the original 2007 Longwing Pearson Ottoman Wars, is in fact a largely new work, reconsidering the question of the military transformation of the Ottoman Empire from 1800 till its collapse in 1918. That transformation, the emergence of the British and French global colonial order, and the spread of creation and spread and creation of new networks of trade and new legal systems, blizzards of constitutional experiments and new technologies of power now serves as the backdrop for this book. Centennials and bicentennials have a way of generating a rethinking of an era and engage historians in sizing up a hundred years through the lens of the present. In that context, I often think of what I do as fill the gaps. So the comments that follow are meant to offer another way of thinking about the Ottoman reform movement of the 19th century. My topic is the evolution of the fighting forces and their commanders, enslaved, converted, volunteer, or conscripted in the long and violent dissolution of the Ottoman Empire. It has to say, there we go. In 1800, <coughs> the Ottomans faced their own existential crisis brought about by the arrival of the global colonial powers in the Eastern Mediterranean with the British, Russian, and French. The late 18th century wars meant the coffers were empty and security was an all-time low because of the collapse of the vaunted Janissary system. In its stead, as was a consistent and unique pattern in Ottoman history, the Sultan and his entourage mobilized self-sustained and proudly autonomous ethnic or regional communities serving and just as often resisting the Sultan as Levent, Delhi, Haiduks, Klefs, Bedai, Bashabozuks, Sipahis, Chetajis, and Komitaches, to name the most obvious. All had centuries of highly autonomous interaction with the dynasty and were mobilized as necessary and just as quickly demobilized or eliminated by the Ottoman military system in case of rebellion. The manpower they represented was to be included in the newly devised conscription system of our period, though it was restricted to Muslims only for most of it, or as irregulars, the Bashabazuks, later Hamidiye cavalry, used for particular missions in the remaining Ottoman territories. 
The process of pacifying these autonomous military societies, turning them into modern tax paying, property owning citizens is only part of the story of the reforms, but it underlies much of the unrest and outright rebellion from 1850 forwards. The striking aspect of the process is the degree to which the officer elite reformers contributed and or contributed to and or promoted the radical changes to the society around them and created a modern military system while continuing to benefit from and prolonging the sultanic patronage system itself. None of this is particularly unique to the Ottomans when compared to their Austrian, Russian, German imperial neighbors of the same period, but cultural differences are significant. What follows then invites us to trace the evolution of a patrimonial imperial style to a constitutional Muslim monarchy, Muslim in parentheses, to a secular parentheses, military republic via the changes to the organization in control of the army. Or to put it away, the three stages might be described as compliance with a new international order, rebellion against the local imposition of that new order, and reinvention of that order, successful or not. My comments are organized around three influential late Ottoman military figures as a way, <coughs> excuse me, into a society in rapid and destructive disillusion. Their careers conveniently divide the 19th century into three parts, who died in 1855, and the last of the cool, aka Gulam households, the Pasha household, as I call it, in the French phase of reform. 1840s to 1880s, the era of conscription and reordering, under Generalissimo Amer Pasha Latas, who died in 1871, convert, an Ottoman commander during the Crimean War, and I've dubbed this the era of counterinsurgency, armies and foreign fighters. 1880 to 1918, emulation, education, and independence of the military system under Mahmoud Shevgev, who, as you know, was assassinated in 1913. I call this the German phase the German model of military autonomy and the, uh, the arms race. So let's take a look at Husved Pasha. In 1808, Sultan Mahmud was enthroned in the midst of the single largest rebellion on the streets of Istanbul to date, and his age was one of the most tumultuous of all the Ottoman eras. Combining the new national challenges of Serbia and Greece, Mehmet Ali's regime in Egypt, the final destruction of the Janissaries and war with Russia, 1612 and again in 1828-29. Mahmoud II was the first Sultan to leave Istanbul on a tour of the provinces since the late 17th century and remained committed in his own way to the reform of his military system, which had begun as a new, new order under his predecessor, Selim III. Under Mahmoud II, targeted conscription made it first made its appearance, but the army was still Muslim. His reforms may have aimed at introducing a constitutional monarchy, but in reality, it became the new Muslim absolutism. His commander in chief and grand admiral, Admiral Husrev Pasha, died in 1855, just under hundred years old, before I switched sides. This is a, a Victorian Albert uh, print from the 1810s. And I love it because of the way Mahmoud II is surrounded by his Janissary sons, which was, you know, the image that they tried to project in that context. Oops. <coughs> Born in 1756, Husred Pasha remains one of Mahmoud II's most enigmatic officials. He was initially brought to Istanbul as an enslaved Ulam. Abhazian youth, where he became the protege of Chabush Pasha Saeed Effendi. By 1792, he's in the entourage of Grand Admiral Kachuk Hussein Pasha, Selim III's masterful reformer of the Navy. Of the Navy. His naval military career thus began in Egypt in 1801, in command of some new order troops fighting Napoleon alongside the British. He was sufficiently distinguished uh, in, in the fight to be promoted, to be promoted to the rank of azir, and was briefly installed as governor of Egypt. 
However, in the struggle that followed with the Mamluks, Albanian irregulars, and Mehmet Ali, he was kicked out, driven out of Egypt by decree as Mehmet Ali consolidated his own power. Their lifelong rivalry is said to have begun at this point, and Pusweb's reputation, ferocity, and poor administration is grounded in these events. Thereafter, Pusweb is to be found in the European provinces serving on the Danube River in the 1806-1812 war and command again of some reformed troops. From 1811 to 1818, he rebuilt the Ottoman fleet on the Danube, once again as Grand Admiral. By 1821, he's back in Istanbul and is a towering figure in all subsequent events around the destruction of the Janissaries and the introduction of the new reformed army. He served as Grand Admiral again, Greek revolt in the Peloponnese after 1822, where he clashed once more with Mehmet Ali and Mahmoud II was forced to dismiss him and take him back to Istanbul. Thereafter, in Istanbul, he's appointed commander-in-chief of the new army of Mahmoud II, a position he occupied until the death of Mahmoud II in 1839. By 1828, when the new reforms introduced the Mansure, and then, the, and then, then we go to the uh, Nizamiya armies, as they are called, closely linked to Husrev, it became known as Husrev's rules. He was the official who managed to pull together the 20,000 to 40,000 strong new army that faced the Russians on the Danube in 1828-29. That two-year war, it will be remembered, brought Istanbul close to occupation by Russian troops. Helmut von Molke, then a young man in his 20s and part of a Prussian mission to train Mahmoud's artillery observed, the army consistent, he was watching them leave Istanbul, <coughs> of men disciplined after the European fashion, wearing Russian jackets and Turkish trousers with Tatar saddles and French stirrups and English sabers. It consisted of Timariots, troops of the line, and militia, who served only a term of years, of whom the leaders were recruits and the recruits mere children. The system of organization was French and the instructors were men from all parts of Europe. The splendid appearance the beautiful arms, the reckless bravery of the former Muslim horde had disappeared. But yet this new, new army quality, which placed it above the numerous host, which in former times the port could summon to the field, it obeyed. So you have here a picture of the same place, the Sultan leaving the mosque on horseback. And Mahmoud II cultivates this image and there are really considerable number of portraits of Mahmoud II in this new guise. <clears throat> That's why I have him uh, entering the world stage. So when Helmut uh, von Malta entered Pasha in 1836, he was 80. By the end of Mahmoud II's reign, he served as commander of the army troops police chief of Istanbul, chief of the general staff of the military, and minister of war. Dismissed as commander early in 1837, he was briefly reappointed for a short period in 1846 at the age of 91. Husserl Pasha had no children. He maintained instead the exceptionally large and last Gulam household, a patrimonial mentorship program typical to folk to pre-Ottoman Pasha households, pre-1800 Ottoman Pasha. He paid for their education, supported the newly built School of Engineering, and sent several of his protégés to be educated in European schools and languages. Of, uh, a, the, uh, a list has been made of the 50 male protégés. Some 30 became Pashas, Grand Viziers, Generals, and Ministers of the late Ottoman state. Husrev and his hand-picked favorites, therefore, controlled almost all the offices of the empire. His final infamy, infamy is tied to a last grab at power in events surrounding the accession of the new young Sultan Majid in 1839. Husrev is said to have wrenched the seal of office of Grand Vizier out of then uh, Vizier Rauf Pasha's hands and assumed the office himself. Husserl Pasha was thus Grand Vizier when the Gülhane Edict was promulgated on 3 November 1839. 
He managed to keep the seal for almost a year until June of 1840, when his age and misdeeds allowed his chief rival, Mustafa Rashid Pasha, Pasha excuse me, to remove him amid charges of corruption. His rev was sent into exile and his network was gradually replaced by translation bureau modernizers, such as the well-known reformers Ali and Fuad Pasha, themselves protege of Mustafa Rashid, whose contributions to bureaucratic constitutional reform have been far better documented than those of the military officers. Husrep left no memoirs or any lengthy comments on the state of Ottoman affairs, but his influence on the Ottoman transfer until 1840 is clearly enormous. In 1890, the library at Ayyub showed here the Husrev Library had over a thousand volumes, of which 400 to 450 were books on military regulations. The library and household served as the incubator of what might, one might call the Salon of the Pasha's household, engaging a deep respect for elders or Middle Eastern societies and cementing patrimonial obligations while inculcating military knowledge and practice. His self-interest prevented the creation of an independent military class the development of a modern general staff and a modernized curriculum that others would build were in fact building in the same period. And yet the dynasty survived. <coughs> Ahmed Pasha is the most distinguished Ottoman officer of the Tanzimat theater period, but he is an outsider. Born Michael Latas of Serbian parents, Ahmed Pasha deserted the Austrian army for Bosnia sometime in the mid 1820s. Emir Pasha to Islam and Islamic Ottomanism, whose military prowess was much admired by the European military elites of the period. Knowledge of him comes from other sources, such as the Ottoman military archives, as he apparently left no memoirs. His passage into the entourage of the Sultan was through the patronage of other con converted officers and Husrev Pasha, as it happens. He joined the army under Mahmoud II, serving as an infantry captain and instructor in the Harbiye, the new military school in Istanbul. An audience with Mahmoud II turned him into a tutor for his son, Abdul Majid. Once Abdul Majid was Sultan, Emir Pasha was promoted to the rank of Brigadier General near Riva. He also married the daughter of another Nizamiye officer and his only daughter, who later met Mustafa Jalatin Pasha, a distinguished Polish convert and member of the general staff. Ahmed Pasha was often in charge of the troops requisitioned to restore order following the final expul expulsion of Mehmet Ali's army from Syria after 1840. 1842-43, as governor of Lebanon, he's in Damascus commanding 15,000 to 20,000 troops aimed at reducing the power of chieftains in Lebanon. 1846-47, he was charged with the pacification of Kurdistan, especially the rebellion of Bedir Khan. For that success, he then became a field mushir, uh, promoted by the Sultan. In 1848, the Mer Pasha Field Marshal of the Rumelian Third Army is called back to the Danube, where he will spend the next decade uh, to restore order in Bedin and then in Bosnia and Montenegro. Seems to me the major issues for local populations in the year of reform continue to be excessive taxation, conscription, and the reorganization of property. Bosnia after Albania and Kurdistan was a particular holdout against conscription. In addition, large Muslim landowners continued to resist the new land reforms as laid out in multiple attempts at this period. Amer Pasha had under his command some 8,000 Nizamiya troops and many Hungarian and Polish officers who had joined the Ottoman army after the 1848 revolutions. One estimate suggests that 6,000, 7,000 fighting men crossed at the Dean from Europe, and perhaps as many as 100 of those became officers, most converting. Amer Pasha was successful in curtailing many of the feudal privileges of Bosnia during the um, martial law period when he was there. 
He built the first road in Bosnia between Travnik and Sarajevo. He repressed Brandigit, brigandage with a stern hand. He closed the frontier to Croatia and stopped smuggling. But his stern rule, however, provoked international protests. Austria demanded and obtained his recall. And this would start this system of the intervention of the great powers. The continuation, I should say. Repression of the new order sort, it has to be said, was seldom followed up with significant investment from his thumbnails elsewhere, and it proved impossible to institute significant change in the agricultural sector. While attempts were made to respond to the peasant demands, uh, large estates continued to be run by their Muslim landowners as tax farms. This tension led to further rebellions after the 1870s that would convulse large parts of the Balkans and provoke increase, increasing European intervention. So by the evidence of this earlier career, Amer Pasha was clearly ruthless and effective, having participated in pacification campaigns all over the Ottoman territories by the time of the Crimean War. More importantly, his pacification efforts exemplified what de developed as the Ottoman military solution to local governance martial law accompanying slash enforcing radical change. As Mesut Uyar and Edward Erickson note, field army structures and the demands of counterinsurgency operations resulted in mission-oriented groupings of independent detachments and ad hoc forces command, of which Emir Pasha, over which uh, Emir Pasha excelled. Such small armies became permanent groupings in the volatile post-1860 countryside, making it difficult to build trust in the official regimental structures and chains of command, even as military headquarters and schools continued to be built across far-flung Ottoman lands. Senior Ottoman officers spent a good part of their careers fighting rebels, tribal confederations, and collecting taxes rather than warfare. It is small wonder then that the resistance to the Sultan grew significantly among the officer class, as well as the bureaucratic class, with the concatenation of crises in the 1870s. <coughs> Amir Pasha's successes led to his appointment as the Generalissimo of the Ottoman army in the Crimean War, which what Many was the first botched global war, partly because of reporting via the telegraph and photography, more importantly for the use of colonial troops, troops, the singular lack of knowledge of the terrain, the confused agenda, and the incompetent leadership. The months before the declaration of the war in late 1853 began with Russo-Ottoman hostilities in the Balkans with Amir Pasha in command. His primary strategy was to defend the lower passes of the Danube River Basin something they had been doing for a hundred years with Russia. The Ottomans had several notable victories against the Russians around Gideen prior to England and France declaring war that turned Omer into a local hero. Note the, the image on the left. He's at the very top of the, of the lithograph. Uh, that's Omer Pasha surrounded by the commanders and the, the monarchs are at the very bottom, Victoria on the right and Napoleon III on the left. <coughs> The later record of the Ottoman Empire under his command in the Crimea was abysmal, however, as it clearly became apparent that the Ottoman officer class was insufficient and highly corrupt, this is Westerners reporting on this, of course, or made up of new, inexperienced, and much ridiculed academy graduates. The Ottoman army was held in contempt after a poor showing, suffering from the cold, lack of food, and insufficient medical supplies of everyone else, Amer soldiers were turned into labor battalions. By July 1855, he had grown tired of playing the part of the colonial subject and chafed at the idleness. He left his post to go to Istanbul to plead his case to the Sultan and the war ministry. His pro proposal was to take his troops in the Crimea to the relief of the siege of Kars, the largest fortress, as we know, in Eastern Anatolia. While at the palace, he was much celebrated, rewarded with some of the properties of no less the late Husserl Pasha, and ridiculed in falling in with the corrupt intrigues of the palace military command. 
The months long debate over sending a relief army to the Caucasus is well documented, as is the failure of both Allied and Ottoman relief forces to rescue the soldiers besieged at Kars. British commander William Fenwick Williams, who is the center of the large picture on the right, surrendered a garrison on the verge of starvation to the Russians in November 1855, and shortly thereafter, the war was over. Now, this picture uh, was done in a studio uh, by and, and with consultation of uh, survivors of the siege. Um, I understand it was paraded across England to raise money for the the primary purpose after its creation in uh, 1855. It's actually a little later than that. <coughs> so our Emir Pasha, and you should note in the picture, the Basha Bozuks I've, I've talked about, the very left one on the horse is, is, is a Basha Bozuk in, in that picture. Down here you have the Madonna style image of the great heroic uh, um, artwork of the 19th century. This could be included, I suppose, in the Orientalism school. And over on the right, there are three um, Amiya soldiers with the fezes. Those are, uh, well, they were the most of the soldiers in, in the fortress itself. Amir Pasha is promoted to field marshal in 1864 and briefly made minister of war in 1869. And he dies in 1871 in Istanbul. The fallback, my point about this period, the fallback for suppressing provincial unrest and to be the mobilization of the standard military units of regional armies, now supplemented by fractious tribal cavalries, the new Basha Bozuks who dominated the military forces in the Caucasus campaigns of the Crimea. The continuation of such security practices reflects the inability, in my mind, of the Ottomans to com master complete control over its empire-wide military command strategy. Now, the big left picture on the left is of the French Zouaves, who uh, are Frenchmen by that time. They're not natives. A man as convert then and now is often subjected to scrutiny about his loyalty to the Sultan and the Ottoman way, and his actions peel back like an onion to find his true Bosnian-Serbian essence. Nope. Ivo Ibo Andrich's uh, fictionalized biography of the 1850-51 events in Bosnia, which is makes very good reading, actually. <laughs> in one of the few contemporary files, uh, profiles that survive, by contrast, he has his talents as a strategist. For his intimate knowledge of the geography of the, of the Danube region, and as having commanded the affection of his men, it is worth noting that he was in favor of adding non-Muslims to the army, but the resistance of the enlisted man to non-Muslim officers and the income from the Christian military buyout tax, the Bedell, continued to be stronger arguments for the sustained restriction to Muslims only. In point of fact, universal conscription was promulgated only by the Committee of Union Progress in 1909. The Crimean War exposed the state of the reformed Ottoman military, and the colonial powers required a recommitment of the reform agenda in 1856 with the proclamation of the Hafi Humayun. Until the time of Sultan Abdul Hamid's succession to the throne in 1876, constitutionalism arguably remained on the table. Local councils were given some autonomy to elect their own governments, and military education was accelerated. But with the defeat of the constitutionalists, when the new Sultan used the 77-78 Russian, Russian Ottoman War in the Balkans as a pretext to close parliament, military reform entered a new phase. Abdul Hamid's paranoia is well documented. By contrast with Mahmoud II, who sat for numerous portraits, Abdul Hamid did not allow his picture to be taken with the result that we have more caricatures than portraits of the 30-odd year reign. Abdul Hamid retained control over all military matters through a palace-based military council, and in himself followed events very intensely, leading to confusion in the chain of command, ferocious rival in ranks. He let the Navy rot in harbor and kept military supplies locked up in arsenals, 
resisting initially the proposals of the experienced officers around him. Among those senior commanders of the era, Mahmoud Shevket Pasha stands out for his independence and commitment to German-led organization of the army. <coughs> Shevket Pasha was born in 1856 in Baghdad of Arab slash Turkish and Georgian background. His grandfather, in fact, is reported to have been swept up in Georgia by the Gulam system and sold to the governor of Baghdad, where he was educated and later in charge of his own troops. Shevket's father served as a Mutusarif of Basra in the 1850s. His mother belonged to an Anatolian Turkish family relocated by the Ottoman authorities in settling the Arab provinces. Then, Baghdad Governor Ahmed Midhat Pasha became Shevket's patron in the period 69 to 71, 1869 to 71, and placed him in a local elementary school. He went on to the Harbiye in Istanbul, where he excelled and continued in college, finishing in 1882. Thereafter, Shevket Pasha climbs the ranks rapidly, reaching the level of divisional general in 1901. Shevket Pasha's general independence and loyalty to the preservation of the Ottoman system apparently earned him the trust of Abdul Hamid. As a result, he was given important tasks, such as overseeing the installation of the telegraph in the Hijaz. He's also involved in Egypt in 1880. The, <clears throat> the Franco-Prussian War military leaders to Prussian-style military reforms. Part of the reason that the Sultan was finally persuaded to request military aid from Germany. Mahmoud Shevket became a protege of Van der Goltz, pictured there, the first and longest serving of the advisors sent by German Kaiser Wilhelm II. Shevket spent 10 years in Germany, where he was an assiduous translator of German military works into Turkish and gained renown around his knowledge of weapons and ammunition and the new nation technology then in development. He wrote a number of military treatises, and his is the most consulted two-volume work on army organization, its uniforms, old and new, illustrated on the right of your screen. He has also been called the father of Turkish aviation. The Germans, as we know, adroitly became the chief suppliers of Ottoman armaments and military loans, and as investors in major infrastructure products, such as the Baghdad Railway only finished in 1940. Germany's Kaiser Wilhelm II made several trips to Istanbul, first in 1889 to secure the arms trade, and again by royal invitation in 1898 when he toured Syria. Re remarkably, the only head of state to do so in the Hamidian era. By this time, we are speaking of an army organized in seven regional armies, including Yemen. The Nizamiya, or regulars, stood at 250 to 275,000 men, and the reservists, the Radif, when mobilized, were to create, at least on paper, a wartime army of 1.7 to 1.8 million, all based on German models. None of it functioned well. Shortages of men, supplies, and officers continued. The major problem was education. General staff became the center for training a new generation of young officers, from which would spring the leaders of the Committee of, Committee of Union and Progress. Abdul Hamid, overcautious about modernizing his arm, army, did not understand the did un, excuse me did understand the need for education, and in 1883 turned his attention to secondary education. Military schools had been established in cities with army divisions. In 1845. By the 1880s, Iradiyas, essentially high schools, offered career paths into the mil military for, for the civil. This did begin to affect the quality of the officer corps, though the numbers were still insufficient for the presumed size of a wartime army. But unre unrest was endemic across remaining Ottoman territories, nowhere more than Albania and Macedonia, and it was there that army commander. Now Birinji Ferik, Mahmoud Shevket was appointed in 1905. As such, Mahmoud Shevket is justly celebrated for the swift response to the 1909 military uprising in Istanbul, a counter coup 
among the rank and file soldiers and religious students that erupted in protest abdication of Sultan Abdul Hamid by the CDP and the restoration of the constitution. All sources on the period speak of Shevket's independence and insistence on the autonomy of the military following the abortive counter coup. <coughs> Significantly, Parliament was restored, but the Sultan was forced into exile and Mehmet V was installed in his stead. Shevket himself was interrogated by the <coughs> members of the CUP and the Parliament. Uh, tensions to install a military dict dictatorship, but he was apparent adamant about that standing apart, which is why I've included the New York Times 1909 article on this set of events in which it says he has been to all the consulates. Uh, reassuring them that he means to be uh, stand clear of, uh, of any kind of attempt at military dictatorship. With Abdul Hamid's departure, the reign of his personal military advisory council was finally disbanded and decisions about the military were moved exclusively to the Ministry of War and the General Staff. The consolidation the military man made it possible to overhaul the hierarchy of command and undertake a serious divisional reform of the army. The Minister of War, briefly Mahmoud Shevket Pasha, became the sole advisor to cabinet and parliament in the period leading up to the second anti CUP rebellion in the army in 1912. In January 1913, the CUP seized power and turned again to Mahmoud Shifket because of his enormous popularity with the army. And, and he was a short period both Grand Vizier and War Minister. And several decades ago, there was a, there's a, there's a small journal kept by uh, Mahmoud Shifket for those last days of his life as Grand Vizier and War Minister. Mahmoud Shevket continued to work on the boats, lobbying for a larger German mission that led finally to the appointment of a World War I commander and general, Iman Van Sanders, as head of a delegation of German experts. And he has said Mahmoud Shevket remained suspicious of the Central Committee of the CUP to the end. This is a story so well told by so many others that I didn't go into it in detail. On June 11, 1930, the Pasha was assassinated. 1913, excuse me. The Pasha was assassinated in the streets of Istanbul on his way to the palace. As a testament to his popularity, some 5,000 spectators, including select representatives from the great powers, attended his burial in the in the cemetery of the Monument of Liberté of the Day Viviet, created in 1911 to honor the fallen soldiers of the 31 March incident. Mahmoud Shevket's career and record on military reforms exemplifies the groundwork for the military republic that emerged from World War I, not just in Turkey, but in many of the Arab states as well. The military reorganization of this Hamidian period, including educational institutions and command structures such as general staff, were to have the largest influence on the post-Ottoman world, especially in the extensive uprising of Arab nationalists whose Leader included Ottoman battlefield veterans. I have used the lives of three remarkable Ottomans to point to three aspects of this reform period from 1840 to 1980, 1918. We should always remember that there's only one thread I'm talking about, multiple choice. You can follow the great powers, you can follow the intellectual life, you can follow public opinion. I'm working here with military. The habit of command driven by the Pasha household, which thus created fractious and competing centers of military command, continues to, to be in use across the rest of the period. It's no longer Gulam centered, slave centered, but the CUP and all the various circles that emerge, and some of them secret and some of them not, where are talking about military reform and, of course, civil reform. I think that this is very much an Ottoman thing. The style of pacification and imposition of new rules empire-wide, empire-wide, <laughs> excuse me, the small army, small wars, counterinsurgency model. I don't know. I mean, you know, it's happening in Africa, it's happening elsewhere, but 
I, I see it emerging here as a way to get to the nation state. And the dependence on foreign military investment and technology to catch up, obviously, central to great power intervention, um, his dedication to the German model, um, I also think is indicative of, um, of the way in which you see after mandate, even through the um, creation of the modern Arab and Turkish nation states, these, these patterns. Patterns of colonial military resistance to global intervention are still very much in evidence. In this, what you would call it, it's a map, but it's a description of the geography of chaos that is, was printed in uh, Le Monde Diplomatique in 2007. Uh, this kind of resistance to global intervention is still very much in evidence in the Middle East. We don't seem to have discovered another way to uh, illustrates. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Virginia, for an absolutely uh, fascinating talk with the most telling, telling details that we could all kind of intersect with and, and interchange with. In, 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 in places, ways I hope, you know. <laughs> absolutely, or the, the ways I'm sure we all have our individual takes on in it. Um, could you possibly stop sharing the screen? Because oh, otherwise sure. we can't see the... Well, that's when I think you see people raise their hands and so on. Uh, ah, there we are. Thank you so much. Well, please just uh, do, do raise your hand if you'd like to ask a, a, a question. And just put, whilst people are thinking about that, um, my, my, and a parallel interest of mine is in, is in uh, uh, archaeological and, and uh, reform and reform of the antiquaries code throughout this period. Right. Um, and one thing I find absolutely fascinating is the way we've got this really almost on the surface appears to be military chaos almost. They really can't get a handle on it. But at the same time, there's an Ottoman code of, an, uh, of antiquities emerging comparatively smoothly. Hamdi Bey is busily working away. He eventually does get a bit of cash. He does manage to uh, do something fairly successfully. Uh, you do see the beginnings of the staff in that period, which is carried on into the Republic. And so we've got this curious contrast of comparatively competent organization of, of, of an military service within this wider disaster which is unfolding. I don't know how you put the two sides together. Uh, well, you see that I didn't. <laughs> it was a military story. <laughs> I think the generation below us is doing a lot to talk to revisit all the documents of the Tansy Month and, and try, try to understand this. But uh, it, it does appear that uh, the administration is giving a lot to the foreign powers in order to keep afloat. And, uh, and you know, you see that most finally in uh, Macedonia and Albania, of course. But uh, um, I, I, I have no other explanation for it, except that they haven't previously, well, there are two explanations. I mean, there are territories that were not really systemic parts of, of the empire before they, you know, no, no, Northern Albania being the example, even largely Kurdistan, what we call Kurdistan. Um, they're, they're bringing it into the empire in some ways in the first time, for the first time in the 1850s and 60s, in a serious way. So mm. I think that's part of it. Mm. Well, 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 thank you very much. Please, who would like to ask a question to our speaker from our audience? Do just put your hand up uh, and we can see you from our screen here. I can see Mehmet Ali Dekadem has, uh, has made, made a nice a nice applause. Thank you. I, I, I don't know whether you have a question uh, from your, from your work. I just, um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Raksan. That, that, that was, um, I mean, it asks a lot of questions, and I think that's the, the, the best part of it. Mention a number of um, Germans ha and how important uh, the Prussian military uh, ideologies, training, etc., was, especially after the uh, Franco-Prussian Wars. Now, this is just an open question in, in the sense that um, you know something to reflect on. I mean, uh, how important? I think you suggested towards the end that um, notions of German nation state. I mean, that, yeah. that kind of feeding in. I mean, I, I would, I would have thought that they came I mean, with the CUP, 
and also with the Kemalist tradition, uh, yeah. they, they were they were really sort of fighting it out with the French as well, beginning with Rousseau and, uh, and also so. So I mean, how into the the German input into uh, in, 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 into uh, ideologies, ideas of nation building, as well as the French Jacobin uh, tradition. Yeah, <laughs> the two kind of come together in the general staff. I understand. <laughs> And you know, that's where the especially within the CUP, uh, the, the importance yes. of Rousseau, for example. Yeah, well, the CUP it comes out of the general staff, a good number of them. So, uh, it's uh, you know, they're in they're the, the military in the in the Balkans. So, um, I mean, even Ataturk was in the entourage of the uh, uh, Mahmoud Chetka Pasha. So, it, it's a good, it's an excellent question. I think it's being re reviewed and rethought. As we as we speak by the young, I mean, uh, you know, what point does uh, does Jacobism um, trump trump the sort of patrimonial style or, or the Vatan or the you know the nation in arms? All of those all of those things are up for grabs. And I also think the struggle about whether they're going to be a Muslim republic, uh, an Ottoman, you know, the the, the struggle over uh, religion in the new in the new context is we. We did it to CUP, but what I kind of want to say is that over the whole century, this stuff is influence, influencing those who come out of this context in, in multiple ways. And, uh, you know, the real debate about it goes on after the CUP takes power, of course. Does that make any sense? There's my, my speaker. Yeah. But of course, Ataturk did have interaction with the with the German high command an awful lot. Of Absolutely it. did. Absolutely it must have been influenced uh, at some point. I don't know how early on in his career. You know, that doesn't really show in his later his later um, actions, of course. It, well, there is the uh, you know I'm not uh, I'm I'm a newbie to World War One. <laughs> you know, I spent most of my life in the period up to and, and ending with uh, Mahmoud II. But it, it does appear that. Uh, there's been an overemphasis on the British betrayal of the Ottomans and the, and the business of holding back the dreadnoughts, um, when in fact this it would appear to even with and uh, and there that uh, there is there is this back and forth with Germany going on forever, and it, and and has it has to with arms and technology as it does with manpower on the ground and, and command. Oh yes, I remember a newspaper headline in one of my first trips to Turkey, it must have been in the 1980s, which said Enver, Enver Pasha was bought with a, by a sack of gold by the Germans. I don't know yeah. if you remember that. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. But uh, a, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Um, well, uh, questions please. I don't know whether, whether Andy or Caroline, you have any, any comments you'd like to make, but please, please go ahead. I don't know, it's sort of way beyond my, <laughs> I'm not very good in the entry. Like Ginny, you know, the First <laughs> World War is sort of, it's pretty hard, oh, to, <laughs> hard to deal with. I mean, you had to recreate yourself, Ginny, to take that <laughs> in, in this new book. So, yeah, it's uh... and, and it had exploded. I remember that, you know, the meetings we had in when was it? Yeah, 2018 or was it? I mean, was it 19, 2018 or 2014? Suddenly there were all these conferences in Istanbul and so much new work. Yes, and World War One. The Ottomans had just been left out of the story essentially, and suddenly there were all these young. Turkish scholars, Turkish, I mean, state-wise Turkish, I mean, there were, you know, Turkish yeah. Greeks, there were, were, you know, Armenians, suddenly working on all this interesting stuff, which no one had really looked at before. Well, just, let's just take the Muhajirun Commission, you know, the, the Refugee Commission that's set up after, in the course of and after uh, World War, uh, Crimean War, um, that has now have, has uh, all kinds of studies of about, they've been able to get at statistics about the number of Circassians or, you know, I'm using that as a generic term, of course, number of people coming back to the empire, being forced back to the empire by the chaos in, in other parts of the Balkans is, uh, we're getting specifics on this. That's what's very, very interesting um, when, you, when, when documents become available and these are, these are second and third generation um, children of these events in some ways. But yet we still know so little about the figures that you talked about. I mean, right. biographies. 
I don't know what Turks might know more. What about Kemal? He knows. Well, the, the, I didn't say it about those biographies, but we, the, you know, I have stretched the, the limit on what is able. Uh, at least I can I can find to date using the the, the mastery of the internet, uh, <laughs> not being able to get to some. Um, you know, his rev has it full. There there is a PhD uh, document a uh, PhD um, thesis that. Um, through his whole life, through the documents, right? Through the documents, and you're, it's huge, and you can pick out bits and pieces. Uh, but there's nothing like that for Amer. Uh, there are some Crimean, uh, new Crimean war studies um, for Ahmadchev. Um, his status as martyr, I think, um, means he's 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 not. As far as I know, someone can correct me. I don't know of a biographer, maybe in Turkish, that I don't know about. Or German, for that matter, but uh, there's very little on these folks. They didn't talk about themselves, and then that's the problem with Ottoman biography. Mm, well, thank you. I see that Mehmet Ali's put some comments in the chat saying uh, about uh, yes, Atatürk's reading of, and I absolutely agree. I mean, I, I, Atatürk was, was was a man of the Enlightenment. I think Andrew Manga was quite yeah. right. Expressing that he wasn't at all interested in in, in, in German, um, whatever you want to call it, military, whatever it is, um, you could characterize the German system for it, it, it just left him cold. Um, yeah, uh, I, 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 absolutely. But nevertheless, of course, without the German organization, it would have been a quite different story at the beginning of the, of the First World War, right? So, uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, any, any more questions from the, from, from the floor, please, Simon. Yes, uh, very interesting, Virginia. Although I'm having a little problem hearing some of the uh, dialogue through the. Um, I, are you in the UK or the US or? I'm in Canada. Right, that's why it's coming a little down the line. Oh, I'm so sorry. I hope that wasn't the case with everybody. That's technology, fascinating. <laughs> um, please forgive me. I'm not a scholar of the period or an academic, uh, so my most of my reading has been fairly contemporary stuff. But um, one thing that sticks out, uh, talking about the First World War period, uh, and it could have been uh, the book that I read on Gallipoli, which is a popular novel, but basically based on historical fact. And one of the things that came through time and time again was how, how many of the German staff cars were seen driving about in Istanbul long before the start of the war, uh, yeah. how the relationships were very close, and how they were promising all kinds of uh, military support and arms and everything like that. Yeah. And then a fascinating bit, and, and I still recall it, um, as far as I understand, a, a delegation did go to Constantinople, to London, and bearing in mind in those days it would probably have been by train, about five days, and they arrived in London and were told that nobody was available to see them. And their primary objective was to see if they could possibly join the Allied side rather than the Axis side. And so they had to go all the way back again with their tar between their legs. And of course, the Germans were absolutely delighted and, 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 and then said, right, you know, we, we are here and embrace them with all the arms and money on the German side. I don't know whether you or anybody has any further information on that, but that's, that was quite a startling thing for me to read, and hopefully th there is some truth in that. Yeah, it was what I was suggesting before, that the histories have been written largely as if it's the betrayal by the British that forces the, the Ottomans into the German camp, and you just suggested that's another possibility, um, and I don't think so. I mean, I do think that the, there's sets of negotiations going on, and and the Germans step in where the British have step out. So, uh, you know, there's the question about Enver. Mustafa Aksakal is about the publisher of Enver, which may help us with this. <laughs> I don't think you could have been in a part of an, uh, an army organization, whatever it was by the end of the 19th century with, without having some German uh, or, you know, at least getting hold of translations as Mahmoud uh, for, for the Turkish army, I mean, the Ottoman army. Um, it's, uh, it's, 
one of the interesting collections I ran into years ago, and I haven't been back to investigate, was at the Hoover Institution on War Revolution Peace in Stanford, California. Uh, and it was, it is a collection of Turkish manuals translated into German. You know, it's very, quite, quite large uh, that's been conserved at, uh, at Stanford Institution. And so this, it's this question of the way knowledge is, is going across borders and from army to army, which is one of the ones I've long been interested in. Uh, and, and there's another example of, of how it was done. And that could well have been in Ottoman Cyrillic script, of course. Yeah. Because that's yeah. a Turk himself, of course, changed the language. Right. Uh, uh, changed right. the characters by standing up in parks and actually chalking it up. And one of his many, many great achievements was, was to bring the language up to date, which of course- Absolutely. Did, am I wrong? Did he not also spend time in Germany at some point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember, that's the point when it, it said that he, um, he, he was laughed at um, because of his uh, Ottoman hat. Um, yeah. And so he, he, that was one of the reasons why he wanted to change it. So presumably he didn't have a very good time when he, <laughs> when, 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 when he went there. Um, no, I mean, yeah, please, please, Caroline, go ahead. Oh, you're muted. Um, yes, yeah, so time and again, I come up against these guys and perhaps you've clarified. Sitting earlier on the history of Pasha period, they're recruiting and in Crimea and war and so on. All these groups, yeah. I mean, there's Zouaves and there's Bashi Pozooks and there's, you know, all these different types. Are they types of troops? Are these re regional designations? I mean, how are they recruited? Is yes, in, very the, in the actual picture, regular... or... Sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just, yeah, I mean, the, you mentioned lots of them and I can't remember who they all were, but... Yeah. Um... Well, they appear in the documents as these... Uh, but do we know... Group? who they are precisely i mean can you ident can one identify precisely who they are no i mean well, by the time you're in the nizamiya uh, order uh you have basha Bozooks who are irregulars official irregulars to the ottoman army but they're still behaving as if they're autonomous and they, you know part of this has to do with lack of money i think and salaries and how how they're paid as well um, and there's still, there's still large swaths of uh, the, the, extern the external edges of the Ottoman Empire that are controlled by these folks. So it's, it's, that is the, the, I think the systematic thing that goes on. And the interesting part is how they do get, for example, the Bedouins to be, come into and be part of the Ottoman army or the, and that's late. But Albania, they have to, they actually have to take uh, um, um, troops into Albania to get soldiers they need for uh, the final battle against Mehmet Ali. So, you know, that's a conscription, raising troops, period. Uh, you know, it's, 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 I don't really have a, a true answer for that, Caroline. I think it all the way. Okay, well, let me put it this way, because we associate Bashi Bazook perhaps with the Balkans. Yeah. Generally. So did they have Bashi Bozooks also in Anatolia? Were they also called, or from further afield, you know, from well, the Arabic ones? We know about the infamous Hamidia cavalry. Yeah, so are they also called Bashi Hamid himself, uh, and they are largely out of, uh, they're Kurds, they're largely Kurds. Um, and so that's a kind of an artificial, based on, like I noticed, is the Hussar tradition in Europe, you know? But they're not called Bashi Bozooks, are they, ever? No, I mean, they're different. Not that particular group, no. No. So it's but not Bashi very Bozooks, clear. No, it's not very clear. Okay. And by the end, they have such, such a probium after 77, 78. It's hard to wonder. You know, I showed you the picture of the Zouaves, who were actually uh, Moroccan and Algerian French troops originally, colonial troops. And then they become French troops. It's a kind of troop that lasts until World War I. Zouaves in the American army. And the Ottomans adopted, they even had uniforms for the Zouaves. So, you know, it's, it's all very confusing when, when you're talking about the, 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 the roundup of these ethnicities. And, and then when they become sort of the armies of the, nation, the nation states that are evolving as well too. 
That's true. Okay. <laughs> I haven't. I am quite. Well, we don't really know who Levents are in the you know seventeenth century. So you know, it's sort of hard to pin them all down all the well, time. You know, I, I've often said that if you're talking about Levents, it's on the paper, and somebody comes forward. It might be a bunch of a band of brothers, or, or it might be a neighborhood that's collared a few of the men to come forward and get the pay. It's Levents, right? Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, this is, a, this is a habit in military context that um, uh, is, is very, very confused in the, in the late 19th century, 18th and 19th century, really, but certainly after Mahmoud II. And all of the European powers are saying, well, why aren't you taking the Christians into the army? Why aren't you taking the Christians into the army? This goes on, that discussion go on, certainly in the Crimean. Um, and it is, it is a curiosity. Well, I think those who can buy out are already buying out the Christians. And then as soon as it, uh, um, conscription in 1909 happens, then go, anybody who can buy out is buying out and leaving the country. So it, this transition to an army that's under your total control, as Helmut von Molfa said, from an army that has operated with impunity and, and, and autonomy is, is a difficult one. And, it's still not quite finished, I think. <laughs> yeah. Where's our- Go, go ahead, great, come on. Yeah, great, great conversation here. Thanks for the presentation, Virginia. I, I'm not a historian. I have to make my Catholic confession right from the start. <laughs> But uh, listening to this uh, conversation, there were two, two points that kind of allowed me, dare I say, to make some connections to, to today. When uh, Virginia with Simon, you had that exchange about, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the Ottomans wanting to keep working with the British, uh, but Indian cold shoulder and uh, uh, working uh, and then ended up ending up allying with Germany and then we know what happened. As I listened to you, I just couldn't help but think what's been happening in the last eight, ten years between Turkey and the and uh, Europe as well as the United States. Yeah. I mean, we all, uh, uh, you know, I'm not going to reflect on who runs Turkey right now and his policies, his narrative, his discourse on these issues. But suddenly the crisis in Ukraine, I, I think is revealing, revealing uh, the way in which, why incidentally next week, uh, Turkey 70 years ago joined NATO and there was enthusiasm on both, uh, both sides. And uh, that kind of cold shouldering, if I dare to put it that way, mm -hmm. from the West towards Erdogan is fine. I don't mind him being cold shouldered, but Turkey being cold shouldered did push it into the arms of Putin and Russia, at least played a role. And now we find ourselves in circumstances where I, I think we see dynamics that want to address, dare I say, that mistake and cor correct yeah, I think you're right. where things should be. And the other, the other, the other observation, when you mentioned how Mahmoud Shevket Pasha passed away in 1913, mm -hmm. suddenly it occurred to me how in, in a century later, as the events in Gezi were erupting, I wonder if any of you picked up uh, the Turkish president, then prime minister, using the term Chapulju. Hmm. Remember that time, then there was a big explosion of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, inventing verbs. Chapuljuing, <laughs> etc. The origins of that term, I found out thanks to a, a young American man who uh, was a Fulbright scholar of all the places in Bybord and spoke 
perfect Turkish with a Bible ac accent, was a fan, an amateur fan of the writings of Necip Fazıl Kısakürek. And uh, the then prime minister, three days before, before uh, Gezi Park events erupted, he was raving to his party group how youth should be educated on the basis of Necip Fazıl Kısakürek's teachings. And Necip Fazıl Kısakürek called, uh, uh, Virginia, you made references to how Mahmud Şevket Pasha uh, repressed the rebellion in in the works where Gezi Park is, is Necip Fazıl Kısakürek referred to him and to the younger officers around him that came yeah. to yeah. find, found the Turkish Republic as Çapul Jews. Huh. Çapul Jews who are, I can't remember the exact word, either repressing or uh, killing Islam'ın askerlerini. So the debates of then whether, you know, Turkey would be a Muslim state or a secular state, etc. And the, the legacy of Şevket Pasha was carried over to, uh, to 2013 and to today in many ways. Yeah, thank you for that. That's all I can contribute. I'm not a historian, but uh, these details fa fascinate me, and I've learned I've learned a lot. I'll go back and try to learn more about these three characters, especially Ömer Pasha. There are three or four works that, um, if Craig is willing, I will I'll add a slide to my my slides um, of new. Um, might help you with that. I think the Tanzimat is being fully explored these days. <laughs> and the, these questions are coming up everywhere. But if I may, what, what fascinates me is because I've done most of my work in contemporary migration and refugees. Yeah. Is, is that we know, I knew about the Mer Pasha for the reasons you cited, his right. Croat back, uh, background and uh, together with the Polish and Hungarian right. soldiers, officers and uh, Mustafa Celaleddin Pasha. I didn't know that there was a, a paralliance relationship there. But what fascinates me, and as you historians, I would love to, to be pointed at literature that shows movement in the other direction. Other than Jam Prince, you, you know, who ended up in, uh, in Italy. Other characters oh, oh, that oh. went in, in the other direction, you know, joined the Habsburgs or, um, I don't know, the French or the Russians, etc. But who were Muslims, Ottomans, there I call them Turks, you know. Mm. Right. As soldiers you're talking about. Not necessarily as soldiers, but uh, most obvious would be sol soldiers. Right. I think the, the, the Habsburg Ottoman border becomes fairly fixed about Muslim slash Christian crossing. Uh, yes, it's an interesting question why it, why it wasn't going the other way early, earlier centuries in larger but numbers. Was it, it did, wasn't going or is it just that yeah. no one has studied and uh, looked, in, uh, looked into it? Uh, yeah, I've, uh, I've come across work that sh talks about Ottoman businessmen in uh, Venice and in parts of, uh, parts of it Italy. Uh, I'm vague on the timing of it, but if they, they were, then there must have been others uh, go going in that direction. <laughs> well, we spent a, a fair amount of time studying the minority communities and in those minority co communities could easily have been as many Ottoman Muslims, you know, that, that we just don't get the, the mention, that they don't leave much of a trail. That's the, that's the problem with biography. Um, you know, at the end, they say, when you're speaking about, we, I, I heard a talk the other day about the Greek and how ideas 
about revolutionary matters or about constitutions passed into populations that are, you know, where literacy is a significant problem. When you're speaking 10%, uh, 12% of the population uh, is literate. And this makes such a difference to the ways in which public expression starts to make, have an impact. And why, why uh, the, the French phase, the German phase are important in the Ottoman context for the, for the education possibilities. But I've also come to realize how, uh, how the noise about constitutionalism is just immense in the 19th century. I mean, there's, there's so many varieties that are floating, floating around and the, the Ottomans are actually giving the, the, the churches a right to constitutions and so forth. And so, you know, it's, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's fascinating as a laboratory in lots of ways, as a laboratory for uh, renewal. Yeah. yeah, because literacy is spreading among the, among the millets as well. And yeah. as, they, as they develop that literacy, you're getting local, local scholarship who will then ex 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 exploiting local traditions, uh, often rather made up, but nevertheless projected into the landscape and so on and turned into some kind of literary uh, uh, form, you know, such as the Armenians in the West uh, uh, beginning to, 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 to say that they're descended from the Greek remains, for example, that you right. find the West, sort of creating a geographical tradition. So, yes, it's, it's, quite, it's, quite, it's quite extraordinary. But, but I wanted to ask you as well, I mean, it's really absolutely astonishing that you can have a general at the age of 91 uh, uh, for that long. I mean, I mean, we could say, well, look, this, this idea of patriarchalism has survived into the Republic because of the way that political leaders get this amazing long, long, long longevity, uh, such as Demerel, obviously. Um, yeah. But never, I don't know if you would have, you have any comments on the way a general can command troops at the age of 90. And what's your. Well, I don't think he was going, he certainly wasn't going on the battlefield. He was in Istanbul throughout the whole 1828 29. Um, uh -huh. But he was manipulating who was being appointed to go and work and, and fight. That's yeah. when I say that there's uh, fierce rivalries about who's in charge where and how, how they bring troops about. He would have had that kind of uh, influence. Yeah. Um, I uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't yeah. know. Uh, I mean, that, yes, that's not. 90, 90, he's, he's fairly unique in the, <laughs> in the military history. <laughs> well, that seems to be one <clears throat> shows how the military work reflecting wider trends in Turkish society. Um, I'm sure we can all think of cases in our own work where, where, where we've come across the fact that uh, a ministry is still being controlled by a retired minister uh, 20 years after they've retired. And everyone says, you want to sort that out, go and have tea with X, um, right. who will have a word with the current minister. Um, so that, that clearly survived. But the other fascinating thing is how it, that didn't survive into the Republican army where, where um, where uh, retirement became very, very, very strictly enforced, mm -hmm. and so we've got this 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 this, this, this sharp uh, difference here uh, that emerges between wider Turkish society and the military and the republic. It's also the the case that the CUP um, they basically fire the Alayla as that's the enlisted man who have spent decades in the army and might be as uh, the sergeant or some non comms, you know. That what we call non-commissioned officers, and the, the CUP throws them out, as if you know they, perhaps they they're the source of a lot of the unrest that I talked about the rebellions. But uh, um, uh, you're getting rid of an experienced class of soldier. So there's even even into the uh, first decade of the 19th, the 20th century, you have this problem of of uh, education and compliance. Fascinating. Uh, more questions from our speaker. Um, you can either put your hand up virtually or just wave your hand. I'm looking eagerly at the, at the screen here. Caroline's coming back. I'll wave my hand again. Ah, Am I on um, now I just wanted to ask, yes, so I mean, were there no challenges to Husserf? No, nothing. How did he cling I on? think that's what stunned everybody. It was very difficult. Yeah, well, the challenger was finally Mustafa Rashid Paja, right? Who's but that was like much later. I mean, that was yeah. well... Yeah, before then, the, the fight between Mehmet Ali and Husserv has been highlighted. Major, the major uh, struggle, power struggle going on in the whole period. Um, but in Istanbul proper, does not appear to have been, I mean, again, it would have been junior officers or enlisted men who were objecting to the 
new order. I see my uh, Vaisel Shimshek is here. Uh, he, he works on Mahmoud II. He might have an answer to that. <laughs> He's muted. You're muted, Vaisel, if you want to talk. Terribly sorry, I, I was kind of caught. Uh, the question was about Husrev, but in what aspect would you mind repeating the question? Who would have, who would have been who would have been um, opposing Husrev in that latter period? You know, eighteen uh, twenties to thirty nine. Uh, I mean, uh, apart from Mustafa Rashid Pasha, about who we know, and, and Mama the Second was busy executing people too. So it was, you know, there's a bit of a reign of terror going on. You have to say that from the start. <laughs> I, I can't remember anyone on top of my head, but like right. Ozanur Salji, uh, uh, I think he had also used like a lot of foreign archives yeah. in locating the cliques uh, during this time. I mean, uh, Hussein was the man, so to speak, like from almost 1826 to all the way to Tanzimat. There is yeah. like a hiatus, I think, like for two years, maybe mid 1830s, 30. Six thirty-seven. That's the time when Moltke actually sees him at his home when he's out of office, I think. But otherwise, he's been in the center of a lot of networks. Mm. Yeah, sorry for this, uh, you know, maybe weak answer. But I, uh, if I may add, uh, with the irregulars, uh, Boshi uh, This this was the question asked before. We can see actually some rosters in the archives about the. Composition of Bashi Bozuk uh, Bulus, like the companions, uh -huh. uh, companies, sorry. Uh, I mean, I didn't do like exhaustive research on it, but the ones I've seen, like, it's really like these, you know, movie material sort of thing of soldiers of fortune from, for instance, there was one regiment, uh, sorry, a company employed uh, in, I think, in Syria from Mehmed in the 40s. So the soldiers were from all over the empire. Or, you know, you can see in some other records, like very few chronicles out there, but like, I think Benamanju Olutari, he, uh, he's a local notable in Anatolia. He talks about, he gives like three pages of lists of his men uh, under his command. And there are also some non-Muslims in it, actually. The Armenians who are giving arms and all. So yeah, that's I don't know I mean, what the answer this is, but, you know, maybe to compl further complicate the complicated question of Boshi Bozuk. <laughs> that, yeah, that's that's what I was suggesting about a return to old habits. Uh, you know, after after the Janissaries fail and they, they get the, the the new troops started, but they're still falling back on these contracts. And uh, people object to my the use of person. You just told me that's what they were doing <laughs> in the Bashabos uh, lists. And um, yeah. that's for the mu. I mean, that maybe they had to do it. That's the only way you were going to get fighting men to the battlefront right sorry right, what's the, the difference i'd have to say what's the difference between that and blackwater in the american syrian mm. context <laughs> uh, not too much actually in the mind of the decision makers or you know i was always making the references to the dirty war in the uh, kurdish areas in the 1990s i mean in the minds of the uh, decision makers well i'm not referring to the ottoman ones and the, uh, you know, Turkish intelligence in 1990s, as you know, now people write or talk about things. In the minds of the decision makers, there is a clear distinction between the Bashibos, the irregulars, and the regulars. And the regulars yeah. I, I mean, mean, that's a military well, distinction that's always made. Yes. Yeah, like in terms, okay, in practice, those things always conflict, right. conflate, sorry. But that's maybe one thing that the Ottoman modernity and the, you know, with all those treatises, etc., and the ordinances of the early 19th century. So we see that, you know, there's a book definition of things, even though in practice those things can conflate, whatnot. But yeah. in the mind of the decision makers, there's a difference between the regular and the irregular. I mean, one fun thing, I guess, just really struck me in one of the documents that said, for instance, to distinguish between the irregular and the regular, uh, they call the regular soldiers as the Bashibala asker, as opposed <laughs> to Bashibul. So, uh, meaning literally, the Bashibuzuk means the head broken one, or you know, without a head, without means a lead, without yeah. a lead. Yeah. <laughs> Bashibala means like responsible, 
he's uh, right. attached to something. He's got his head together. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry, didn't mean to take over. Hope this was useful in some oh, thank way. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Any more more questions? Well, I, I think if there if there are no more questions, I think I think probably we just need to thank our speaker for such a stimulating and excellent discussion. It's really made our evening, and in your case, I imagine that the, mor the morning. Um, well, it's but, two o'clock, two thirty here. Ah, or the afternoon, and uh, yeah. so I think I think just a, 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 round, a round of applause. Uh, <laughs> thank you for the invitation. It was great fun. Oh, and, 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 and as I say, thank you once more. We look forward to, to to hopefully welcoming you to our talks in the future. Thank you. Well, I shall say good night to everybody. Thanks, and thank everyone. You. Okay, thank you. Good night. Thank you very much indeed.